Hello, I'm John Stevens. I'm the chair of the Federal Trust, and I'm talking this afternoon with Graham Bishop, who is on the board of the Federal Trust, uh, among many other things. Uh, Graham, the last time you did a piece for us that was on the general crisis facing the city by, posed by Brexit. And there does seem to have been some developments in, on this front, notably the decline in uh, London's share of um, FX transactions over recent months. But the crucial question has always been that of clearing uh, Euro instruments through London. Um, and is it right to think that this is the central issue for the, the city vis-a-vis -vis Brexit? And where is it now? Well, it is the biggest single issue, um, I'm sure, uh, because it's so clearing of the derivatives is so central to modern financial markets. Um, there's no doubt it's it's the biggest single issue now. Um, and what's what's happened and, and what's been going on for a long time is the scale of derivative markets has become a, a global problem. Um, I wrote a paper to the House of Lords on its inquiry on this in March. And just there's some figures uh, I put in figure one um, on the scale. And we've now uh, OTC, over-the-counter derivatives, OTC. So in other words, not exchange traded, but over-the-counter where you have to post collateral and so on. Um, they, at the beginning of this century, they were about 280%, three times global GDP. They went up to nine times at the um, height of the financial crisis in 2007-10. And they're back down to about seven times now. So the problem, the magnitude of the problem has gone down a lot globally, uh, but it's still huge. But now let's just come to Europe for a moment, because it's the European Union is most concerned about the financial stability of Europe, obviously enough. Um, and there you look at the, um, the the value of euro area OTC derivatives, euro denominated, is about eleven times the GDP of the euro area. But if you recognize that about 90% of euro area de um, derivatives are traded in London, in other words, they are the regulatory responsibility of the UK. And in the end, in a severe crisis, it would have to be the UK who would do something first. And you take um, euro area derivatives and sterling derivatives, uh, they are 66 times the UK's GDP, not six, at 66 times UK's GDP. That is phenomenal. And that's why, um, just to take the most recent example, the uh, pension fund problems um, from the mini budget, uh, why the Bank of England had to step in suddenly out of the blue and promise 65 billion, up to, I should say, 65 billion of purchasing of, of gilts to alleviate this. Of course, the Bank of England can step in with sterling instruments because it can print the sterling to buy them. So you see the speed, uh, the incredible speed and the magnitude of these things. And this is small scale stuff. You say that the, the Bank of England can obviously print sterling, but the problem with euro uh, derivatives uh, is obviously that the Bank of England can't print euro. Ah, got it in one, got it in one. <laughs> and the EU has made it extremely clear I mean, actually, in one of the uh, directives relating to CCPs, that any use of public funds to bail out CCPs would have to come uh, as part of a political decision. Um, there would have to be a proper process beforehand. So quite how you would organize that for the ECB to ask and the government to think about it and the European Council to opine and the national treasuries and parliament to view how that would all be done in the time scale where the Bank of England responded to the um, pension funds problem the other day, uh, it's difficult to see. But nonetheless... So where are we now on, on moving euro-denominated uh, derivatives clearing from London? Yes. Uh, Eurozone? Well, um, th th this has been building up for a long time. Uh, this isn't a new thing. It, go back a decade and the EU was talking, when we were still a full member, and agreeing to all the directives and regulations which were being created. They were clear about the financial st stability issues. And about a year ago, Commissioner McGuinness, who's the relevant commissioner for financial services, she gave a speech in which she set out very clearly that 
the, um, there's going to be, first of all, there would be an equivalence, an extension of the equivalence was going to happen uh, the uh, middle of next year. It's now postponed to 2025, uh, make, so keeping UK-based CCPs equivalent, um, deemed to be equivalent. But so there was going to be a postponement of that deadline in order that, uh, firstly, they could build domestic capacity. In other words, Eurex clearing um, and the like would be built up. And secondly, improve supervision. This delay was attributed to the COVID crisis substantially. Is that correct? Well, yes and no. I mean, yes, certainly it didn't help. Uh, but the, the question of how to do this, um, move these gigantic volumes of money to a, from one exchange to another and to do it in a way which didn't risk accidents along the way. It's a big, big thing. So there's no question that uh, the, the timetable, initial timetable was too short. But now, but given that we... Deadline in, you think this new deadline in 2025 is, is a, a hard one? I think so, yes, yes. And so what is very interesting is the, the Commission has been consulting on these matters and actually, I think fairly soon, they will begin to say something. So I found it very um, interesting, shall we say, that the International Swap Dealers Association, which is the trade body for all this, uh, that they um, produced a very interesting paper a roadmap to make European clearing more attractive. And they produced this uh, last, no, um, beginning of October, two weeks ago. Uh, and it's 15 odd pages of pretty detailed stuff. Now, the UK has said all along that we can't, um, the, the EU can't manage it. They can't make European clearing attractive. They're going to have to try and force it. And that's going to fragment the markets and be expensive and dangerous and so on. So the fact that the international swap dealers, the trade body has come forward with a roadmap as to how to do it and doing it by making European clearing attractive, not mandatory and forcing, but make it attractive so the markets would want to do it. I think that's very interesting. I think that's a big straw in the wind. Have we yet had a response from the Commission or from the European Central Bank on these proposals? Uh, not yet. No, not, not that I've seen. This will, I imagine, this... The, if I understand the way these things work, uh, this will paper will have gone in at probably quite a late stage to the process of thinking by Commission and um, ECB. But I've, I'm sure it will have been very thoroughly discussed beforehand. So and this paper by the swap dealers, I mean, is your assessment that the roadmap it sets out is a plausible one and a yes. one, and one would, that the EU would be able to uh, comply with? Uh, well, comply um, who's ordering who around. So not, not quite the word, but that the, the, the community, uh, the union could facilitate without a doubt. It requires quite a number of things. And what they've done is split it into uh, three specific areas. Widen the scope of market participation, uh, participants clearing in Europe, give European central counterparties a competitive edge and then remove unnecessary barriers to clearing in Europe. Um, you may remember the Giovannini group um, two decades ago on how to make European capital markets more attractive. I was part of that, and I, I see the echoes of this um, sort of thinking of identify the barriers and hit them one by one. Uh, but first of all, widen the range of market participants. Um, and I this is... In the light of what happened in the UK uh, just very recently, I think some of these things are very interesting indeed. And it's not just the UK. Um, the derivatives, uh, energy derivatives in natural gas, uh, because we are now, uh, we all, well, all in the, living in the UK are facing this huge increase in our electricity prices, gas prices, because of the spike which happened in August. And it so happened that the the um, reference period for setting the cap for energy prices was right at that peak. And prices, nobody seems to notice, but prices, gas prices have now fallen to a third, not by, but to a third of what they were then. And that was clearly, in my view, a margin squeeze of, if, driven by derivatives. So there are very big real world consequences. We had the pension fund industry in the UK nearly bankrupted uh, within a space of days by margin calls. So the, the, the first big thing that the um, ISDA is suggesting 
is widen the range of market participants. The first one is enable pension scheme arrangements, um, IOPS in Euro speak, uh, to centrally clear. At the moment, they have to clear via um, a, a bank, their, their dealer bank. And so they are at the mercy of their bank. And the big problem, and this is what happened to the UK pension funds, is if they have to put up cash for a variation margin, the, the value of the contract suddenly declines. They have to put up cash right now, today, during the day, let alone at the end of the day. Typically, a pension fund doesn't have all that much cash. It's pretty well fully invested. So where do they get it from? And if they start selling uh, gilts or other Euro government bonds, if we're talking about Europe, then you have this amazing squeeze. So part of what ISDA has said, and I think this was written before the gilt squeeze, um, is to allow um, <clears throat> the, uh, the central bank, in this case, the European Central Bank, to provide liquidity um, by uh, taking bonds as collateral from directly from the pension funds as intermediary. Um, and th these are big items, uh, whether the ECB will want to do that, but if they take those collateral government bonds, as the Bank of England bought government bonds outright, and provide cash at the market price to the pension fund to meet the margin call right now, that's, that's a major source of stability um, and removing a source of instability. Um, <clears throat> just to go then to the second leg, um, give the European CCPs a competitive edge. Uh, they're talking about um, supporting regulation, so modifying regulation to support competitiveness and innovation, um, harmonize central bank assets, uh, bankruptcy remote initial margin with regulations. These are very detailed technical matters. Uh, but if a pension fund or the like, or a, um, if a, a, a public body is going to clear and they put up initial margin, if they suddenly find that they are um, there's a big uh, collapse of the C CCP, which of course they shouldn't be, but they can be, there might be, if the public entity is then required to mutualize its exposure. Ah, mutualize. Have you in some way mutualized public debt? So these are, these are sort of sound simple things, but they're totemic issues. They hit raw nerves. Um, and then just the, the barriers... Uh, these are fairly straightforward things. Um, Post-trade risk reduction mechanisms, uh, intra-group transactions, going through the rule books and removing duplicative and conflicting requirements for international firms, promote international openness by amending rules on recognition of third-party CCPs, um, plug gaps in crisis management powers over systemic CCPs. These, these are... Um, things which can be done, many of them will require amending um, EU regulations and directives. But we've already seen um, on several occasions there's been a fast track change to CRD, um, fast track change. Your assessment is that these proposals will, uh, by and large, be, be brought in, I uh, I and that they, the, they will be the blueprint, if you like, for the shift of euro, uh, of euro clearing from London to the eurozone. But of course. Looking at the competitive issue, I mean, one of the mm -hmm. great complaints of uh, major banks operating in London towards the shift of um, euro uh, clearing from London-based CPC was the economies of scale that you have with also the dollar business. So the question yes. is, if the euro business is moved to the continent, will this entail dragging some of the dollar and other currency oh. derivative business with it, and which would clearly multiply the blow to London as a financial centre. Now you've put your finger on one of the big subjects. Uh, when you have a trading floor um, with dollars over here and euros here, and they can speak to each other and discuss their positions. If you move one away to Frankfurt or Paris or wherever, and there's increasing pressure from the ECB and the bank's regulators to actually put not only the capital, but also the people and the processes in the euro area, in the jurisdiction of the, the ECB and the regulator, <clears throat> is it a simple thing for the bank to do to move its dollar desk as well? Now, that's the question. Has there been any an indication 
from any of the associations uh, involved in this, in particular the, the swaps. Uh, not, no, not yet, not yet. Of, of this of this issue. No, I think what the the sequencing I suspect will be um, a pragmatic thing. That first of all, let's say um, the commission uh, looks at this and uh, decides it'll do and propose a significant chunk of what ISRA is suggesting. I'd be surprised if they don't. Um, so they they set off to do that, and then we find that there are some uh, regulatory changes to be made to MIFID and EMEA and so forth. That all takes time, and so that comes into action and becomes um, operational towards the end of this commission's life. So that's in 2024, 25, just in time for the moment when clearing is meant to move. That's the time when the banks will actually have to face up to the reality of where are we going to put our dollar desks? Are they going to move with the euro desk or not? And if they do, then the city is going to notice the draft. So in your view, this could be a much more significant blow to the city's status as a financial centre than has been assumed up until now. Oh, yes, absolutely. That's exactly it. This is uh, CCPs and the the derivative markets now overwhelmingly, 90% of derivatives are done through um, uh, the central, central clearing. Um, if that is moved, then you have moved a major chunk of the financial markets. And the the impact of this will begin to be felt quite soon because obviously a deadline in uh, the middle of 2025 um, has to be prepared for um, some way before that. Yeah. Well, the, the the procedure is the commission proposes something and it'll be a series of fast track amendments, targeted amendments to these various um, highly technical directives on settlement finality and so forth. Um, a number of those sort of things, a package will be proposed uh, it can go, if it's non-controversial, it can go pretty quickly, actually. Some of these things have done. Um, and so the uh, the banks will be looking at this. Here we are, um, early early next year, they'll be seeing the, uh, the texts, uh, if not before. Um, they'll begin to think and take a view as to whether this is going to go through quickly, because the member states are in favour and the parliament is in favour. So if they begin to sense next year, that these are these moves could are sensible and could happen quickly and certainly will be in force for the middle of 25 um they'll begin to think about it and if anything the the various crises that we we have had already um in, in the uh, surrounding the guild market mm. could be harbingers for further problems if we have a, a significant recession um, and so actually that would be an incentive to move faster on this presumably for the regulators, yes, yes. I mean the the combination of commodity markets, the the gas price uh, spike, and the gilt market. Yes, the gilt market isn't in the EU, but everybody's seen seen it and realizes, hey, these things happen. Um, margin squeezes, uh, margin calls can suddenly spiral, and they do. I mean, in the, in twenty twenty, which is not so long ago now, um, the, the variation margin multiplied by four. And the, suddenly the pension funds and life companies had to put up 50 billion in short order. I, I'm reminded of Ernest Hemingway's character mm. in The Sun Also Rises, who said that he, he had gone bankrupt first slowly and then very fast. <laughs> yes. Hey, many thanks for um, yeah. this um, briefing. Um, look forward to hearing from you again when there are further developments. Look forward to that too. I hope you enjoyed this latest video. It's one of a series of videos about Europe, about Brexit, and about the future of the European Union uh, from the Federal Trust. Uh, we hope that you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then you'll have notifications of future videos, which I hope you'll enjoy uh, as much as perhaps you enjoyed this one.